Okay, class, today we're going to look at the colonies that would later become the original 13 colonies of the United States. First, let's look at Europe, European, well, you know, what the picture in Europe looked like. Um, by this point in Europe, it had been, you know, when we look at religion, it had been, you know, fractured ever since the Reformation when Martin Luther hammered his theses on the church door. At that point, you know, the big Christian church, which is now known as the Catholic Church, was shattered in pieces. Before, if you're a Christian, over 90% of the chances you're going to, you would have been Catholic. But at that point, you start to see Protestant, you start to see Baptist, you start to see all kinds of different takes on um, Christianity. But the main ones for a while, like the ones that were adopted by different monarchs, were the Catholics and the Protestants. And um, depending on where you lived and what you worshipped and who though your monarch was, you know, you were either doing good or you were being persecuted. So if you had a Catholic monarch there, you persecuted the Puritans or the Protestants. And, um, and if you're a Protestant, you were persecuting the Catholics, which caused a lot of re religious turmoil in Europe. People moved from like made, made countries to countries and eventually you see them, you know, they move completely out of Europe to the, you know, to the Americas. Now, the Spanish took, you know, religion to the next level. They saw themselves as the arm of the Catholic Church. And so it, when they're taking over um, the Americas, they're looking at it as, a, you know, they, they frame it to people as like, oh, we're here to convert the natives to Christianity. I mean, but they were hardcore even back home where they would torture people for not being Catholic in their own country. So, a lot of, you know, a lot of these p targets were Jews or former Jews, Confucius, as they would call them. And, you know, people that were suspected of still practicing their old religion would be, get, be sent to the Inquisition and tortured and sometimes killed um, because they refused to convert to their religion, I mean, to Catholicism. Um, anyway, so the first settlement, you know, permanent settlement that would become a city in the United States is St. Augustine, Florida. Um, it, you know, we still, there's the forts and structures are still around today. I mean, when you look at it, you know, when we, you know, look at some stuff like language, um, the very first foreign language ever spoken in the Americas and when the area that would become the United States would be Spanish, not English. Um, as Spain, once Spain starts to pull all this gold and silver out of, um, Europe, it goes from like this tiny little country to this huge. You know, there's a world power, wealthy, and, you know, they're able to fund huge fleets. And, you know, it, and it becomes a rival for everybody, including, you know, Great Britain. And, you know, when it comes to Great Britain and um, Spain, they had many conflicts, you know, between them. You know, um, struggles over, like, you know, what was it, uh, the New World and Britain trying to set foot in the New World. Also, um Britain was, you know, led by Elizabeth, who was a Protestant, and Philip was a Catholic, so he had a, a, the, you know, a religious angle to the whole thing. At the time, England was not as rich and powerful as, as Great Britain, so a lot of times they relied on what they called um, privateers. We call them pirates today, We're, but they were basically legalized pirates. You know, what the British government would do is if you had a ship and you're willing to engage uh, again, you know, a fight against the Spanish. If you're willing to attack Spanish ship, especially shipping, um, is because everybody knew that Spanish ships leading the New World were laden with gold and silver. So you know this is, and all the British government said, you know, just give us a piece of your profits. And so um, this was a huge incentive for a lot of these people. And, you know, later on when, you know, England, you know, defeats Spain and becomes in the ascendancy, suddenly they don't want no pirates anymore because now they're pretty much the ones in control of the seas. But a lot of people who were so lucrative kept going and that's how they became outlaws. Anyway, you know, Spain see, you know, sees Great Britain for the threat it is and decides in 1588 to mount an invasion of Great Britain. They built this huge armada. And they ready all their soldiers and they get their armada together and they sail towards England. Now, a couple of things when it comes to, you know, what was about to happen is um, for sure Spain had a larger navy. Their, their ships were huge, well-armed, but because they were huge and well-armed, they weren't as maneuverable as some of the British ships. So the British ships could like use their size 
to their advantage and use the Spanish size against them. And so um, as they sailed toward um, England, you know, they were met with the English Navy between, you know, between France and Spain. So it was more of a narrow passage. And also the ships would easily outmaneuver some of the um, Spanish ships. Um, they used to fire ships, so they'd use small ships, set them on fire, and they'd sail them toward um, Spanish ships that also used. So when Spain first initially tries to hit southern England, you know, they're not able to make headway to get onto the beachhead. So they try to cir circle around England and come to the other side, and that's when a huge storm hits and um, takes out a lot of the fleet. And then what's left of it limps back to Spain, a defeated force. Now, um, we talk about primary sources all the time. Primary sources are stuff that's created in the time, and they give you information about that time. One in interesting private primary source is this painting you see of Elizabeth here at the bottom. Um, there is telling the whole story of her reign and who she was when that was painted. You'll see on the picture to her left shoulder, above her left shoulder to your right, is this dark image. With, you, know, you can't see it all, but it is. It's like this dark image of the Spanish fleet. Uh, being demolished by the storm. On the other side, you see, you know, the sunny, you know, return of the British fleet. But more so, you look at her right hand, and she is holding the globe because England is now the in the ascension. Like, this is hers for the taking. <laughs> Here you see the path I was talking about, how they go through the southern part, come back around, but then end up, you know, being um, thrashed by this huge storm and limping back. So once it's over, England starts to rise as the dominant naval power and indeed the power in the world, a global power. And you start to see Spain, which is at one point claiming all the Americas, their empire slowly start to shrink. Now, um, when we look at the French settlements and colonies and areas that, you know, I'll show you in the map in a bit that would become, you know, Canada and parts of the United States, um, they were looking to make money not in gold and silver, but in the fur trade. Fur was big back then in Europe. And they themselves like you knew no way how to get fur. But Native Americans did. They knew where the animals were. They knew the environment. They knew how to hunt them. And so this became a lucrative business for both groups. You know, um, they would they would um they would make settlements in Canada and what I guess like I said what would become part of the United States. But these were more like trading depots. These are places where you know to facilitate the fur trade. Um and the French traded goods with the natives such as, you know, they would get furs, but then they would give them European tools, knives, um, all kinds of different things, alcohol, guns. Um, and this could, in this arming of the Native Americans would play a role later in the French and Native, uh, French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War. And here you can see in the map the, what I was talking about. You see where it's in the blue where it says New France, and then you see the red where it says British Colonies. And... They're, you know, they're, they're right to just bump up against each other and for conflict to emerge, and, um, the, and the, that conflict does emerge. Now, when we look at the 13 colonies, the ones that would eventually become, you know, America, you know, historians like to group um, things, and we look at it, we can look at, and we'll, usually what will dictate, like, the kind of economy and the way you live, your culture, kind of like when I talk, discuss Native Americans, is, you know, the geography. So in the South, you had the economy, um, you had an agricultural economy. You know, they were growing cotton, rice, sugar, and so forth. Um, middle colonies had a mix, but mo it was still mostly agriculture because they, could, they had, did have good land for, for growing. And then you look at the New England colonies, it's more rocky area. So, you know, they deal more with shipping. So let's go further into that. Um in 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 England, um, ninety five percent of com you know ninety five percent of the population were commoners, so they didn't own property. They had no political voice. Um, they had like twenty five percent of them could actually vote in Parliament. So a lot of them wanted to come here because um, in Europe had created a system where land equal money, land equal power, land equal the voice in government. So they were itching to find somewhere to get a hold of their own piece of land. And they already had come with these concepts that, you know, they weren't invented in America. They already had them in, in Great Britain. The Magna Carta, which established, you know, the, you know, the limits of the power of the king, an English Bill of Rights, a good uh, set, 
a system of common law. They already had re representation as far as like in Parliament, you know, uh, the Lords and then the House of Commons. But like I said, land was tied so much to most of the stuff. Um, as the, the you know the Columbian Exchange emerged, new types of uh, concepts of economy starts to grow, um, and then control of said economies. Um, you know, it's when we the places established colonies like England, they were they tried to control and keep the money within the empire, so they weren't allowed to buy or sell to uh, to any other uh, to anyone else but England. They had to buy the goods exactly from them. Um, we also start to see uh, ex import and export to um, create the system we refer to as balance of trade, which basically means um, if you import more than you're exporting, like you're buying more than you're selling, you have a bad balance of trade. If you're exporting more than you're importing, you know, selling more than you're buying, then you have a good balance of trade. And these concepts still, you know, exist today and govern us when we talk about, like, you know, loss of trade to one country, or, you know, to China, to India and different places. You know, this is all these concepts that start to emerge after, you know, the, the discovery of the new world. Now, um, much like um, when Spain first starts to establish colonies in the New World, they use conquistadores, so they funded themselves. When it comes to establishing some of the colonies here in the uh, in in what become America, these were like corporate ventures. People gathered together, put their money together to invest in a colony and support a colony, and like and um, and this is kind of how a lot of the colonies established. Now the very first colony is the mis is the mysterious colony. Um, it's the first colony that's established in the New World. Sir Walter Raleigh establishes it. He said settles it with about a hundred people. He names the whole land there Virginia, in reference to the Virgin Queen. Um, in 1587, John White leads a second group of uh, colonists to settle there. And there we have the documentation of the first foreign born, I guess, person in America, the British, you know, a citizen, you know, who was born in American soil, and that's Virginia Dare. Now, why, you know, got um, established, the, um, brought in the next wave, but he realized they needed more supplies, so he had to sail back to England to get more supplies. Unfortunately, he sails in the middle of the war, and it takes him a while to get back. When he finally returns to Roanoke, you know, what does he find? Nobody. Um, they only find, the only evidence uh, left behind is a word carved into a tree, Croatoan. Um, to this day, there's all kinds of theories, and, you know, some are way out there and some are, you know, closer to what probably happened. And what is closer to probably happened is they probably left the island in search of supplies and in the end ended up joining with different native tribes who took them in. Um, there's DNA testing to this day, trying to determine that some people there, you know, there that there are people living in the, you know, in the United States that are descendants of the people that came from there, but you know, and also have uh, um, a mix of native blood from some of the tribes that would have been in that area. But to this day, since we'll never know for sure, it is forever known as the Lost Colony. Now, Jamestown becomes the first permanent British settlement in America, and, but it's the second attempt at settlement. Um, the seven named, you know, James I, who's now the King of England, and it's supposed to be a, you know, settlement of gentlemen farmers, but who's going to do the labor, you know? And for them, you know, someone else is going to do it, the Native Americans, uh, you know. And they bring, and they don't actually bring with them people that know how to do any of this stuff. And this is, you know, this is beyond me, and you're going to set up a settlement, and then you have no, you don't bring people with the knowledge on how to do anything like this. You know, first of all, the location they they pick is a swampy area. You know, and, you know, yeah, it's it's hard to get through whatever they saw, they felt themselves protected, but it is also brings disease. And because, you know, they, they, they can't get any crops going, there's disease ravaging, we see 66 of the first 104 settlers die. And then we, st we also see evidence through archaeology of cannibalism. And you can, that, that really shows what dire circumstances they were in. 
Um, you know, and, and many were like, you know, because they heard stories of gold, whatever. They prefer looking around trying to find gold than trying to, like, feed themselves. John Smith um, um, emerges in the colony and takes control, is the virtual dictator, controls the food supply, forces everyone to work. Um, now, he's the, you know, you could, you know, say he's the reason the colony turns around. Um, he, but he's like, you know, he, like I said, he runs it like a dictator. He's eventually run out of that colony toward the end. Um, he does document like this time there in a work called The General History of Virginia, read by a famous man I'll talk about in a bit. Now, um, we all know or should know that um, films aren't good history, but one of the most horrible examples is Disney's Pocahontas. Um, Pocahontas would have been about eight when she met John Smith, but it wasn't really a meeting meeting. It was a ceremony that her tribe had to, to show how magnanimous they were, where they would pretend they were going to execute you. And then one member of the tribe this time was Pocahontas, the daughter of the chief was chosen to do, is stand up and come and get in the way and stop the execution and show you're under our protection and you'll be fine now. And that's about the extent of her interaction with John Smith. What's really horrible, some of the stuff that's come out, especially about the cartoon, because like I said, she would have been about eight when this happened. But, you know, we've seen memos in Disney saying, oh, let's make her teenage girl. She'll be more attractive to the audience. Sadly, she also ends up being captured and raped at the age of 13 by some of the colonists in order to, and in order to foster um, better relations. Her husband married her to a British merchant known as John Ralph. And this is after kidnapping her and, you know, all these horrible things. But, you know, back then marriage was used to unite people to stop wars and stuff. And so, you know, the king agreed to let her marry him and in the hopes of fostering better relationships between the two people. Um, she's eventually baptized and renamed Lady Rebecca. They take her back to England to tour the public. She even meets with the queen. And she, you know, she eventually sick, you know, succumbs, gets sick, and passes away. One interesting story is that she uh, was scheduled to meet with William Shakespeare, who had read um, the the history of Virginia that was written by John Smith. And um, a lot of people don't know this, but Shakespeare was a great social commentator, a, crit a critic of, of society. In fact, you look at a uh, play like Merchant of Venice, where he's kind of like almost championing women and feminism by having the two main characters, women. They just dress as men, and they're the heroes of the story. Um, there's, you know, he does this several times in different plays. And um, because he had read the history of Virginia, he writes a play called The Tempest. Um, because he kind of knows what England's up to. And in The Tempest, what it is, is a shipwreck of all the... Of these people, these wealthy people, they land on a desert island. Well, it's not a desert island; it's occupied, um, and they're just completely lost. They can't. They don't know how to. Live. You know, how do we survive? Where do we find food? And there's two inhabitants on the island, and one one of them is uh, a mother and a son. And the son is Caliban, and Caliban, you know, teaches them where to get food, how to grow food, how to feed them, best places to live, you know, how to build homes, and just basically how to survive. And once they get to a point where they're surviving on their own, they enslave Caliban, and they take the land for themselves. And so um, Shakespeare gives them this long soliloquy about, like, you know, the mistreatment and how I gave, you know, I, I helped you survive, I helped you with this, now you've enslaved me, now you've taken my land. He's basically speaking for Native Americans. Now, Jamestown finds its success in tobacco. You know, it's, you know, tobacco really is what, you know, got America, you know, literally this, you know, America wouldn't be America if it wasn't for tobacco. I mean, they start growing in 1616. By the 1660s, 10 million pounds of tobacco were sent to England every year. And you could get a five to 10 times uh, profit from it. So a lot of people switched to tobacco, and this became a cash crop. Unfortunately, tobacco does it destroys the soil. It eats all the nutrients. And these people aren't rotating their crops where you, like, leave a certain part of your field, you know, alone for a year. That way it replenishes nutrients. These people are trying to grow as much as they could. So when it's destroying the soil, what do they need to do? 
get more land and they need to take that land from Native Americans, creating more and more conflict as they spread their borders deeper and deeper into Native territory. So this began a series of horrible wars. Now you have to understand it's at the beginning when these wars start, Natives actually outnumber the, the white settlers. So the white settlers got to get creative as how to fight the Native Americans. So 1623, they burned down all the crops bef before they're able to pick and, in, in, in a sense, to starve them out. Um, later on, they tried to, like, you know, have a hold of ceremony to apologize for what they did. And then they poisoned the alcohol to kill them. So, you know, warfare begins from there. You know, in 1644, natives launched a surprise attack against Virginians, killing 400 of them. And in, in time, though, Anglos start to outnumber the natives as disease does its job and more and more uh, people come from Europe. And then that's what changes the tide. Um, one sign of things to come in all this is Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. Uh, Nathaniel Bacon um, organizes a rebellion against the governor of Virginia. And the reason he does this is because the governor of Virginia, who's so tired of conflict with the Native Americans, tells people, you cannot extend the borders anymore. You can't take any more land. You need to stay where you are. But there's, you know, Bacon, you know, leads a lot of people that want to keep taking more and more land. And so um, they form a rebellion. And in this rebellion, he, he takes in endangered servants. He takes anyone he can. They, they burn down Jamestown. Um... But eventually, they get more British troops in and crush the rebellion. Um, but what is interesting is, you know, like I said, it's a sign of things to come, is how, you know, these colonists reacted to any time they were not allowed to take native land. In fact, this is one of the major causes of the American Revolution, is the denial of them to take more land. Um, in Virginia, we see the establishment of like a, you know, a self-governing body known as the House of Burgess. Um, they were the first representative governing the New World. But like I said, these ideas were already, you know, they had them in England and they were just bringing them over. You know, and, but you know, like I said, they needed to, you know, up their um, population in order to be able to dominate the land. So there was all kinds of things they did to bring more people over to what would become the United States. Um, hit the head right system. Gave, uh, you know, up to a thousand acres to people who are willing to come and settle America. The goal, like, is to populate the economy and also provide labor, since, you know, labor wasn't to be had with Native Americans. And, all you know, basically to make sure the tobacco, grow, you know, um, tobacco industry continues to thrive. Now, a lot of people couldn't afford to come. Um, so they were, they came as indentured servants, which is basically a limited time as slaves, you know, sometimes from two to seven years. Um, sometimes uh, they, they were using, you know, convicts and orphans first to get sent over here. That's part of your punishment. Um, upon completion, these, a lot of these people were promised, you know, tracts of land. Um, but a lot of them, because of disease and stuff, they died before they even finished their contract. You know, and much like, you know, the, um, the ownership of slaves, African slaves, they could be gambled away, traded, and sold off and different things. Their owner could do all kinds of stuff with them. About one half to two thirds of people that came from Europe were indentured servants. Um, they were most like most likely to be used in the northern areas. Um, they they in the north they had used them like in the shipping and you know you had slaves maybe even like house slaves and so forth. You know there was some kidnapping sometimes and there was there was money to be had in using indentured servants. But indentured servants, you know. In time, it will eventually stop being used, you know, in the dominant uh, dominance of African labor on top of the fact that, you know, slavery just starts to dwindle in the north. And it's Virginia that, because of the tobacco industry and stuff, becomes the backbone and where, it, you know, it allows for the other colonies to start to become established. Maryland is an interesting case. Lord Baltimore um, gets it set up here in the United States as a haven for Catholics. Now, um, in American history in general, next to, you know, 
you know, you have Jews and the other persecuted religion is Catholicism. Catholics are always looked at as disloyal to America because they don't, they were, they serve the Pope, not the, not the president and so forth. And that's the excuse people have always used to persecute Catholics. So Catholics are very persecuted, especially in England. Um, so they come and establish here. But what's interesting about Maryland is that it eventually becomes the place for religious toleration. And, they, and it starts with, you know, Catholics and practice their faith there when nowhere else. But then they opened it up to any faith to practice there. So you start to see the first idea and concept of freedom of religion. Now, New England, this is, you know, the rocky area, the soil, you know, there you can see, you know, if, if you could grow something, it's a very short season. Um, so you weren't going to get, you know, rich farming, but you had to find new methods, new ways to um, to promote you know, the economy. And for them, it was shipping and trade. All that stuff that was being grown and packed and all that, that was being taken up there and they would be shipped off. You also had a big time whaling industry um, before we used oil. You know, we they used whale blubber sources like lamps and stuff. And unfortunately, to this day, even though we don't need to anymore, there are places that don't practice whaling. You know, colonists who settled in New England, you know, paid their own way. They came for religious freedom. You know, um, they relied on children as labor. Um, two, only about 2% were slaves. You know, Puritans wanted to. These guys are the most extreme of all the you know, religions that are in Europe at the time. They wanted to purify the Anglican church that had been created by Henry VIII. Um, they, did, they didn't see them as living as good Christians. And because they're all out, outspokenness, they had to flee and move from place to place. Finally establishing, you know, headway here in the new world. Um, a lot of them, you know, had even moved to Holland for a while and then, then decided, you know, in group, in mass to move to America. So they sail on the map. You know, um, then the myth of them landing up Plymouth Rock. You know, that's not the actual rock. But um, it was this, you know, they found this place. This, you know, this is where we'll settle. And they, before they get off the boat, they send this Mayflower contact. And it's, a you know, or the first actual paper document of a self-government, it creates a direct democracy of the people. I mean, half the pilgrims die in the first four months, you know, and then the other half survive. Um, and when we look at, like, um, how and when they survive, you know, we look at Thanksgiving, but, you know, what, what really happened and how did they get to that? And that was due to Squanto was a Native American who had been held captive before and had learned English. And he is sent by the local chief to help them, thinking they could make a good alliance. So he teaches them how to farm, you know, how to grow food in this type of environment. And then, you know, the, 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 the survival becomes a celebration on this Thanksgiving. But what is interesting about Thanksgiving is for Puritans, a day of Thanksgiving is actually a day of fasting. And sadly, you know, these very people would later, you know, be run out of their homes and attacked by the same people that were giving thanks for them to help them survive. Um, the area didn't have a lot of natives because there was already disease and war had already, you know, dwindled some of their numbers. Plus, um, some of the land they were settling in wasn't really good for, you know, settling, you know, putting large scale um, settlements. So a lot of natives, you know, there was a sparse native population. The Puritans saw the sign from God, and um, but and like I said, as soon as they start to spread their borders or need more land, well, they become in conflict with the Native Americans. In the 1630s, we see a huge increase in population uh, in the established the Massachusetts Bay Colony led by uh, John Winthrop. Um, Puritans had this work ethic, and they had this interesting idea. It was called predestination, which meant that um, when you were born, it was already decided whether you were going to go to heaven or hell. And so this always left a big, um, you know, um, river of anxiety going through the society because you never really knew if you were going to heaven or hell. You never knew if, like, your good work was going to... You know, to, you know, if you're doing this good work to maintain your position in heaven, or you're doing it all for naught. And so they were, you know, very anxious, very fearful society. 
Um, John Winthrop, you know, comes up with this concept of the city upon a hill where here we're going to make the, the great society that no one else could do because they weren't being true Christians, true to the religion. And this is this concept of a city upon a hill. Now, when we come to a Puritan society, it is a theocracy. There is no separation of church and state. You know, um, so biblical law is law. You know, you could be, um, you know, any sin was a law and you were subject to be punished by it. Whether it was, you know, you know, being locked in the stocks or be or whipped or, you know, uh, or at times, you know, burnt to the stake for witchcraft. We'll talk about that. Um, we still have, and they established these things like, oh, no, no, no. Um, these were more religious-based laws, which are now known, which were known as the blue laws. We've had them for a long time. Um, places in the South still maintain some concept of blue laws, like Texas, you know, where you can only, it, when, I mean, when I was a kid, you could only buy groceries on Sundays. Now, as time moved forward, you know, things changed, but some things stayed the same, which is like, why, like, you know, you still, it's like real limited on when you can buy alcohol. That's all remnants of the blue laws. Now, Puritans saw everything through supernatural means. They, you know, the, the concept of science and disease and all that, that just hadn't gotten there yet. And so if you got a, a disease, your crops went bad, it was the work of Satan, the devil. There were ever-present Satan worshipers everywhere. If, the, you know, there was an eclipse or a comet, all these things were, you know, birth defects. All kinds of things were, were uh, believed to be the work of the devil, the work of witches, um, yeah, there's, when we, you know, looking back into it, there's little to no kind of this activity, but it was the only way they could explain, you know, things that was strange to them. And this led to the infamous St. Louis witch trials. Um, when you have to put the, yourself in the mindset of these settlers, um, they were um, not even living in the city. They were living in a small village outside of a city, surrounded by a deep, dark forest full of animals they'd never seen before. We talk about animals coming from old to new, but there were plenty of animals in the old in the new world that, you know, old worlders had no idea what they were. You know, one great example is a grizzly bear. You know, the thing was a myth to them. We think that's where the origins of Bigfoot come from. But so, but, and on top of that, you know, they're surrounded by these Native Americans are constantly at war with, and these guys are, you know, they look different. They don't worship God, so therefore they must be worshiping the devil. So they're just surrounded with evil and anything going wrong, you know, in, like I said, is immediately the work of Satan. And as when kids start to act out as a group of girls, you know, they, um, when they're approached by their parents, you know, then they start accusing. First, it starts with their slave, Tituba, and then it goes on to then they goes on to accu accusing lots of different people in the village. And in the end, you know, 18 in the pung, when one man was stoned to death. Um, and the ones that are killed are actually the ones that refuse to admit they were witches. Because if you admitted it, you know, they believed in forgiveness of God and that you would actually be let go. Now, as they, you know, as um, Anglo populations rose and as the need for more land, you know, happened, we get into the series of wars like the Pequot War and the horrible massacre at Mystic, which was a settlement. Um, and in there, uh, the the Pequots had a like a fortified settlement and they set it on fire and shot anybody who came out, basically wiping out most of the tribe. The only ones that survived were the ones that were out on a hunting party. You know, then we have King Philip's War. Um, and um, what the British start to do is start to, much like, you know, Cortez does, start to find uh, alliances with other Native Americans who are at war with each other. And so, you know, um, we start to see um, battles with mixed, you know, um, you know, Europeans and natives fighting other natives. And this is one of the, when it comes to percentage of loss of life in Americans, this is the worst in all the wars. Remember, we're talking percentages, not numbers. And, you know, um, the war was the single greatest calamity to occur in the 17th century period in New England. In the space of little more than a year, 12 of the region's towns were destroyed and more damage. The colony's economy was all but ruined and much of its population was killed, including one-tenth of all the men available for military service. You know, the result, 600 colonists die, 3,000 natives die, the war ends when Metacom, die, Metacom dies, and King Philip. Um, 
But for, you know, 600 colonists to die was a huge chunk of the population at the time. So when we look at percentage-wise, this is the worst war um, that would become America ever fought. Um, <clears throat> then we see this episode like Rhode Island which you know, by Roger Williams, which creates a society where it actually wants to do separation of church and state. And this is where the concept comes from because they want more freedom and less you know, regulation by the church. Um, a, a famous figure emerges from there is Miss Ann Hutchinson. Ann Hutchinson um, gave birth to something big. Um, she led Bible studies, and at the time, women weren't supposed to do stuff like that. And she was so intelligent that and um, that most of the villagers would actually go to her Bible studies and actually going to church. So she's eventually hauled um, before court for doing this. And you know, and she's told in court now, you'd rather be a husband than a wife, you know, a preacher than a listener. Because you know, women should be you know, wives and listeners, not talkers. Um, she out argues every man in the court. She's eventually exiled um, out of the out of the colony. But what's interesting is she displayed such intelligence, and you know, like I said, out argued every man in court that they decided they needed to educate their men, and so the school known as Harvard was created. Now, in Connecticut, we see the first actual written. And the fundamental orders of Connecticut. Um, and then, you know, middle colonies, like in New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, you see. Uh, Pennsylvania is actually founded by a Quaker, which is another re religious sect known as William Penn. And Quakers believed in um, total equality. And they saw slavery as wrong. They were not violent people. They were pacifists. And they, they, they were known for having good relations with the Native Americans as well. Um... When we look at, you know, and it's at this time we in America goes through so many religious waves of re, great reawakenings where, you know, um, the fiery preachers, the, you know, putting the fear of God and everybody. And this is known as a great awakening, the first great awakening. And you start to see this like re religious revival springing up everywhere. And this is in response to just the surroundings, a response to like, you know, let's turn to God, you know, because of all the fear and anxiety that's out there, especially with, you know, the wars and we're living in a strange land. And, you know, and at the time there's no, like every colony is kind of setting things up differently. So to bring some, you know, semblance of order organization and so you had these big tent revivals going out there everybody now the the um the wars with native americans kept growing and growing as the colonies grew and took more and more land eventually um benjamin franklin leads what's called the albany congress and what he's trying to do is force the, the colonies to work as one to defend themselves against Native Americans. I know you've probably seen this picture before. And, you know, and some, a lot of people refer to it from um, the American Revolution, but it's actually from the Albany Congress. He's trying to say, like, you know, if we don't unite, we're going to be chopped to pieces because we're surrounded by Native Americans. And we need more of an organized resistance. It does fail. Only like seven of 13 colonies attend, and there's no real consensus of what to do. So it does kind of fall apart. But it's the first concept, like, we need to find a way to work together. You know, they establish, you know, what would later become New York. Um, they were a great fleet. You know, they owned a great fleet. They ran, you know, part of the slave trade, but they also believed in diversity and groups of numbers. Work, they worked with the Native Americans. Um, and their, their big settlement would be Manhattan, which later becomes, becomes New York City. And um, 